the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. My Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me, that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask your pardon for my sins and the grace to make this time of prayer fruitful. My Immaculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me. Last few weeks, I've had the opportunity to spend some time here at this conference center in uh, Coteau du Lac, just outside of Montreal. It's a conference center called the Manoir de Beaujeu. And I've been coming here over the last 35 years or so, and every time I come, one senses a uh, calming effect. It's perhaps the effect of the St. Lawrence River that uh, is right close by with the gulls passing over the water. The wildlife, even the greedy groundhogs seem to be becoming more numer numerous and the deer also, who are very accustomed now to people walking around, and they hardly ever run away when you pass by. The beautiful natural environment that we have here gives one a sense of serenity. And particularly when we come here to this chapel with our blessed Lord right here and the statue of Our Lady this old wooden wooden piece is an ideal place to pray, to rest, and to reevaluate what is truly important in life. Perhaps you've come here before yourself to do a retreat. I pray that as things open up more and more and uh, we are able to have these retreats, that more people will have the opportunity to come in the fall and in the winter. It really is a, a bomb, a healing bomb for the soul. And indeed, if you look around this house, there are many images of Our Lady throughout the house. And you can see from the facade this of the house, this French classical style house with its thick stone walls, and this tin roof built in 1826 by a French lord, the Sieur de Bourgeux, it really gives you a wonderful impression on the shores of the St. Lawrence. And most of the time the river is quite calm and one can observe fishing boats and sometimes speed boats going across and the wind carries the sound over the still waters and you, as you sit on the gallery you sometimes hear snippets of conversations from people in those boats even though they're quite far off you hear little little tiny elements of conversation you can't quite make out everything they're saying but they're, they're quite a distance out in the lake but the sound carries and it seems as though the voices are sometimes right there in our backyard. And I sometimes wonder what the conversations of the apostles were with Jesus when they traveled out on the boat. Sometimes it was quite calm and he would instruct them there from the boat. You could probably hear the master there from the shore. If it were quiet enough, you could hear 
the great confidences that he entrusted it, entrusted to, it, to his chosen ones. But of course, during this recollection for the month of, of August, we too want to be quiet now. We want to really pray and listen to the Lord as he speaks to his apostles on that boat. Because he's also, he's also speaking to us from all the scenes of the gospel and everything he says, he's speaking to us. That's how we must read the, the New Testament. We have to read it really with this conviction that he's speaking to us. He's speaking to me specifically. And what is he saying to us? Well, one of the very famous scenes, of course, is, is the scene of Jesus on the boat and the storm at sea. We know that, that a boat by nature is somewhat of a precarious place. The waves can toss it to and fro. And often when we read scenes in the scriptures themselves, in the Old Testament and also in the New Testament, the sea itself or the, the, the ocean is often presented as a place that is hostile to man, out of his control, and quite a dangerous place. It's only really God you know, who has dominion. You know, he separates this, the land from the seas. Only he can do that because he is God. He is the creator. But when we're out onto the seas, like it has a certain, almost, if I could say, ferocity to it. So let us stop now and imagine that passage there. It's in chapter eight. Actually, all of the uh, all of the gospels talk about the calming of the sea. It must have made quite an impression. Chapter eight. We read in St. Matthew, When he got into the boat, the disciples followed him. So there he's giving them his confidences, his, his intimate advice. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. But he was asleep. And they went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, O men of little faith? Then he rose and rebuked the wind and the sea. And there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? What sort of man is this? This remarkable miracle of Jesus calming the sea must have made a deep impression. All the other evangelists took note of it, and they must have talked about it at length. It is called the calming of the storm, and who can calm a storm but God himself? We ourselves have become quite good at predicting storms, we can calculate the degree of heat or cold. We can see on our phones how, you know, how cold it's going to be today, how hot it's going to be today. We can even maybe predict the extent of global warming. But only God, the maker of the universe, can calmly speak and the waves and the wind obey. Only God can do that. This is why it made such a powerful impression, because they, they, they knew that only God could do this. It showed that Jesus had power, and better, he was going to use this power for the good. He was going to calm them and give them pre peace and give them protection. He would not let us be taken up by the irrational powers of nature, by the winds or the waters of fate. What is fate? What is fate? The word fate comes from the Latin fatum, which means spoke, spoken or what has been said. And it is said and done. 
and some religions they hold to this this kind of predetermined uh, inevitable necessity of events in the non-christian religions some ancient ones some very modern ones it's, it's this belief that events kind of constitute a cause or rather a chain of causes and effects with absolute determinism you can't change it they just happen that's fate if some people say something happened to you that's just fate but we don't believe in fate fate we believe in faith we have faith but not in fate rather in providence in providence God's which is God's loving plan for the good of those who love him and he can draw good he can arrange things upheavals and the storms of life for our good because he knows us he guides us he does not det determine us absolutely against our freedom and though we are affected by the events of life the hardships of life the difficulties of life the joys we are affected by our family the kind of person we are by many factors but we're still mysteriously in there we're still free and uh, channeled we're, we're, let's say we're not simply channeled into this dark chasm of predetermined fate God knows us he watches us like a good father and we must trust his providence trust his love let it let the events of life teach us and let us open our hearts to what he wants from us as we read in Psalm 139 you have searched me O Lord and you know me you know when I sit and when I rise you perceive my thoughts from afar you discern my going out and my lying down you are familiar with all my ways before a word is on my tongue you Lord know it completely you hem me in behind and before you lay your hand upon me such knowledge is too wonderful for me too lofty for me to attain and and this is this is the, the role of God's God's presence in our life he's everywhere and but we don't always see him we have to see him in the events of our life we may see him here in an oratory with the blessed sacrament we may see him in a beautiful cathedral or at least get a sense of his presence but he is everywhere he's here in nature we can sense him but he'll be there in the midst of traffic in in the hubbub of everyday life now sometimes in life we get these storms christian tradition has seen the storm or the calming of the storm in various ways in the life of the church it's the storms that happen in the life of the church the upheavals but also in the indiv individual soul and indeed from the earliest times of Christian art and Christian literature this scene has been see has been interpreted as the boat as representing the church after all it's Peter's boat Jesus was teaching in Peter's boat and and the storm represents all the hazards maybe the, the the heresies that the church has had to to face has been threatened and all these things have threatened to capsize the church capsize the boat of Peter but she has not been capsized she's still going strong even amidst the great storms the other day I I went to Ottawa from here and I saw an exhibit by about uh, Rembrandt at the National Gallery in Ottawa. Rembrandt as you know is one of the great Dutch masters of the 17th century we call the the Dutch Golden Age and uh, it focused on his early period so in the 1630s and in about uh, I think it was around 1630 or so he married his wife uh, or a little bit before that uh, Saskia and uh, he was an up-and-coming artist and extremely talented 
and of course what was not at that exhibit exhibit was his very famous painting called the storm at sea it's the only seascape that he's painted and of course it could not be there because it was stolen many years ago back in 1990 it was stolen from the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston in a famous heist that still has not been completely figured out they stole a number of great paintings they stole a Vermeer and a number of other great paintings and among others they stole this famous Rembrandt of the storming this the calming of the uh, of the storm I heard that the FBI has figured out who stole it somebody in some crime ring but they still are investigating further so maybe we can hope that we will see this painting the real thing one day I would really love to see the original for now we have to rely on photos but from the photos we still have we see in this painting the disciples frantically trying to control the boat just like in our life when we have no time when we get anxious when we get so terribly worried maybe we're worried about the next wave of covid or whether we'll get fired or whether we'll get cancer or whether we can finish everything we have to do or what will happen to the children or whether there will be a, a covid passport and we, we get stress we can get very stressed we can be like those apostles in the boat and in the painting with this diagonal composition it it really looks like they're they're about to go over a huge wave and it's not clear whether they're going to survive that wave and if you look carefully at all the figures one is steering a rudder that doesn't seem to be doing much another is actually throwing up overboard he's sick he can't take it he's sick to his stomach and another figure looks directly at the viewer that is no doubt Rembrandt himself Rembrandt himself had a, had a hard life and he was not good at handling finances he lost his wife Saskia when she was only about 29 years old and his children died at a very young age only the last son Titus survived but he too eventually died quite young or at least predeceased him and all these traumas of his own life and these difficulties um, they come out in some of these biblical paintings and he did become hugely popular because and I would say even more after his death, death because of the way he was able to stage these amazing historical paintings and one of his early teachers his name was Schwanenberg uh, he, this teacher of his was specialized in painting fire and he knew how to paint fire because this, this teacher was specialized in painting scenes of hell scenes of the underworld and Rembrandt learned how to paint hell because it required knowledge of, of course light and, and how, to, how to do reflections properly but for Rembrandt it was an occasion really to excel in dealing with light and in the sea, seascape you can see it's dark around but there are glimpses of light on the figures and uh, it's not clear whether whether Rembrandt was a Roman Catholic or a Protestant his father was a Protestant that is a reformed church his mother was a Catholic and there were great hostilities at the time between the Catholics and Protestants. In fact, this is from the Amsterdam period, and there was a ban on, on Catholicism. Like You could not practice the Catholic faith in Amsterdam at that time. And so he may have just, I don't know, he may have wanted to stay neutral, but there are very few indications as to whether or not he was actually a practicing Catholic. But he certainly had a, a deep sense of the power of Scripture. And... And so as we go back to this painting, we realize, of course, that Jesus seems to be sleeping there in the storm. And the church and, and, and Christian tradition over the centuries has applied this fact that, that sometimes the fact that Jesus is sleeping seems to suggest that God 
you know, he he doesn't always seem to come to our rescue in the terms when, you know, when there are hardships. Mm-hmm. And so sometimes we have to say, Lord, we could use you now. We could we need your help to calm the storms of our life or the storms in the church. And uh, and these winds that happen, these difficulties, we have to remember are not actually like like those irrational or unpredictable moments of fate that people sometimes believe in. Some people believe in fate as this destiny that can befall someone without their control. They speak of blind fate and it leads to anxiety and worry. But we have to hold on to providence. St. Thomas Aquinas spoke about uh, providence. He loved to look at the order of the universe, the order of things around him, that everything has its end and the universe works in function of a good end, that God is good and that providence is the conception of divine intellect, divine order and he leads all things to their end just by the events, even difficult events. That's why St. Rosemaria used to often use that expression omnia in bonum from St. Paul's letter to the Romans omnia in bonum which means all things work for the good of those who love him you know? all, omnia cooperantur in bonum all things work out for the good that's part of God, God's, God's uh, providence okay. do I trust in God's providence I ask you, Lord, here now, help me to trust in your providence, even when things don't go too well, when I am when I'm a bit maybe panicked. The Catechism of the Catholic Church gives a beautiful expression or a beautiful definition. It says, um, number 302, it says that creation has its own goodness and proper perfection, but it did not spring forth complete from the hands of the Creator. The universe was created in a state of journeying, journeying in stato via, toward an ultimate perfection yet to be attained, to which God has destined it. And we call divine providence the dispositions by which God guides His creation towards His perfection, this perfection. By His providence, God protects and governs all things which he has made, reaching mightily from one end of the earth to the other and ordering all things well. For all are open and laid bare to his eyes, even those things which are yet to come into existence through the free actions of creatures. That was from the First Vatican Council of De Filius, that last pardon. And uh, really, the harmony of the universe is is like a like a marvelous symphony, the, the with the sweetest and most effective chant of a uh, you know of the Creator. And blessed are they who listen to it. God is the conductor; He's conducting my life. He's also the composer, and He's the greatest conductor the greatest composer, the greatest musician, and he's making, out of all the events of my life, a beautiful symphony that we don't just keep on the CD stashed away in a drawer, but that we must listen to. And there are up, you know, parts where the, where the music goes up, other parts that it goes down, but it's all part. There are the drums, there's the violins, there's the oboes. Everything is part of it. In the end, all creatures manifest the glory of God, and in particular, it is man who must glorify him. We must glorify him. Recognizing in nature, recognizing in our, in our life the work of his hands. We serve him with obedience. So, what do we have to do? Well, the church invites us, and Jesus invites us, to a childlike abandonment Mm-hmm. To, prov- to the providence of our Heavenly Father who cares for His children and their smallest needs. As, he, as our Lord said, Therefore, do not be anxious 
saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be yours. Why does God allow evil? Only our faith really gives the answer to this. Why does God allow evil? It's an answer, you know, that 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 is hard sometimes to under, understand, but it only really our faith. He comes to us in covenants. Uh, there's the redemptive incarnation of his son. He gives us the gift of his spirit, the gathering of this church. He gives us the sacraments. So what we do, we have confidence in God. And maybe like the apostles in the storm at sea, in the calming of the storm, we just say, save us, Lord. We are perishing. I'm having a hard time here, Lord. Save me. And the Lord will rise up. He rebuked the storm. He rebuked the winds. He rebuked the sea. And there was a great calm. This is what we ask of our Lord now. And our our soul can have that calm too, that serenity, that peace. And many of the great saints had that. And let us, let us ask this now of our Blessed Mother as we go to her. Remember what Pope Benedict said in his encyclical on hope. He talked about a hymn that was composed in the 8th or 9th century that was sung by the church for thousands of years. It was a way of greeting Mary, which she was called Star of the Sea. Stella Maris, Ave Maria Stella, Ave Maris Stella. And because our life is like a journey sometimes, it's, and where are we going? What's the destination? The Pope asked. How do we find the way? Life is like a voyage on the sea of history, often dark and stormy, a voyage which, which we watch for the stars to indicate the route. And the greatest stars, he said, of course, is our Lord himself, who is the guide to our life, but also the great saints that are the stars of our life, the examples, and also, of course, our Blessed Mother, the Ark of the Covenant. She keeps us together and, you could say, reminds us that God has pitched his tent among us, here in nature, also in the middle of the city. Let's ask our Blessed Mother, Star of the Sea, to grant us as we finish this period of the summer a greater sense of peace and confidence in divine providence. She will help us, she will intercede for us and guide us as we make our way to God's will in our life. I thank you, my God, for the good resolutions, affections, and inspirations you have communicated to me in this meditation. I ask you help to put them into effect. My Immaculate Mother, St. Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me.